So I think as we're two minutes past the hour, I think I'll just start by welcoming everybody to um, the first um, NHRC site presentation of 2024. Um, and I'm really pleased to introduce um, to you uh, our speaker uh, and our panelists. Today, we have an exciting talk by Megan Muldoon, who is a PhD student in biomedical engineering at Toronto Metropolitan University. And she's a member of the Multimedia Research Laboratory. Her research is focused on machine learning models for echocardiogram data, and her current thesis work is related to the analysis of neonatal color Doppler echoes in collaboration with Mount Sinai Hospital. Uh, and with our panelists today, we have three panelists, Dr. Naimul Khan, um, Danielle Rios, and Wyman Lai. Um, Naimul is a, an associate professor um, of Electrical, Computer, and Biomedical Engineering at Toronto Metropolitan University as well, um, where he heads the Multimedia Research Lab, and his focus is in AI and healthcare. And Danielle is a clinical associate professor at the Division of Neonatology at University of Iowa, and also um, an associate director of the Human Dynamics Fellowship Program there. And her fo academic focus is in the human dynamics of critically ill neonates and predictive anal analytics to improve the outcomes of our extreme low birth weight babies. And also, finally, we also have Dr. Wyman Lai, who is an assistant division chief of cardiology and the co-director of the Cardiac Institute and director of the Echo Lab at Chalk Children's Hospital. Um, and he sits on many boards um, uh, on the Pediatric and Congenital Council Board of the ASC and also an echo, one of the Echo Board of Directors. Um, and without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Megan to start and um, share with us um, her research that she's been working collaboratively with us at Mount Sinai in Toronto. Great. Uh, thank you, Faith. Um, I'm really excited to get started here. Great. Um, so got my slides up. Um, so the title of my talk uh, today is Towards AI-Assisted Quantification of Patent Ductus Arteriosus in Echocardiograms. Uh, once again, my name is Megan Muldoon, um, and I'm a PhD student in biomedical engineering at Toronto Metropolitan University. Um, so to get started, um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with uh, patent ductus arteriosus, but uh, the ductus arteriosus is just a short vessel which connects the pulmonary artery to the descending aorta in the fetal cardiovascular system. And uh, the ductus arteriosus is a crucial part of fetal circulation that typically undergoes spontaneous closure within two days of birth. Um, the condition patent ductus arteriosus, or PDA, is a common heart problem in low gestational age neonates um, that results from the failure of this spontaneous closure. The PDA is one of the most uh, prevalent cardiovascular diseases encountered and managed among extremely low gestational age neonates um, and has an incidence of around 60% worldwide. PDA is associated with adverse physiological effects and also increased rates of uh, mortality and morbidities. Um, PDA-related complications are often a direct function of the significance or the severity of the shunt across the PDA vessel, and generally patients with high shunt PDAs, um, commonly referred to as hemodynamically significant PDAs, are selected for clinical interventions, which would include drug um, and surgical therapies. Um, to determine the presence of PDA, clinicians uh, will often use uh, echo Doppler, uh, uh, color echo Doppler uh, echocardiograms, uh, such as the one that's um, shown in the slide here. Um, and these are taken from the PDA viewpoint, um, which visualizes blood flow through the ductus arteriosus if it's present. Uh, in addition to identifying the presence of PDA, uh, uh, clinicians uh, also aim to determine the hemodynamically uh, the hemodynamic significance, uh, as this is really important for treatment planning. As only patients with this high shunt burden are selected for treatment, and those with lower shunt volume are managed more conservatively. Understanding the shunt volume of PDA can be highly challenging, and often relies on surrogate markers. These markers include the PDA dynamiter, diameter, flow characteristics, left atrial and ventricular inflows, chamber sizes, and also outflows. And while most of these uh, described markers have been shown to correlate with, P uh, with PDA size, 
there's no real consensus on what determines a hemodynamically significant PDA, and PDA therapeutic trials often rely on a variety of definitions. Additionally, there's also a large lag between PDA shunts and the surrogate downstream markers, which can again cause delays in diagnosis and adversely affect treatment effectiveness. Um, further, the clinical use of these markers requires uh, a lot of training and a lot of skill in uh, neonatal echocardiogram acquisition um, and interpretation. So these challenges in diagnosing uh, hemodynamically significant PDA and PDA in general um, have highlighted a big uh, area for the application of software. In recent years, a number of works have been published investigating machine learning frameworks to aid in PDA classification. These frameworks have been applied to uh, various medical imaging modalities, um, and some of them include neonatal phonocardiograms, which are recordings of heart sounds. Additionally, there are works focused on thermal images of neonates. Um, and more recently, uh, there have been a couple applications of machine learning applied to color echo Doppler uh, images for the diagnosis of PDA. So these deep learning models have demonstrated the feasibility of uh, PDA detection in echocardiogram images, and they demonstrate a kind of crucial proof of concept work for the application of artificial intelligence to PDA diagnosis and we hope PDA assessment. So since healthcare is such a unique space for the application of artificial intelligence, I thought it would be important also to outline some general goals of AI applied to the medical imaging domain um, and the clinical domain. Oftentimes, artificial intelligence research focuses on developing end-to-end -end classification frameworks that have a high accuracy. And accuracy is obviously very, very important and achieving a high accuracy is very important, but there are also some other goals that are more specific to healthcare that are also worth noting. Firstly, uh, frameworks uh, applied to medical uh, diagnosis and classification tasks should have some degree of transparency. We often want to avoid fully autonomous architectures uh, that are a sort of black box model, um, as that's not really helpful when it comes to a clinical context where we want to understand the decisions made by the framework. Uh, secondly, we want these frameworks to be explainable, uh, meaning that we want uh, machine learning architectures in these cases to provide users or physicians with explanations of the processes that are going on in the network. Um, those, these goals are a little bit more difficult to quantify than simple accuracy. They identify qualities that are very important uh, in clinical AI systems. So the research to date uh, that I've been working towards uh, is developing a machine learning model for reliable auto detection and shunt quantification of PDAs in neonates. So essentially what we want to do is develop a machine learning framework, which is able to take the color Doppler echocardiogram videos from the PDA viewpoint, and then provide some sort of quantification of what the shunt volume is. Additionally, we also aim for this system to be something more than just a black box. Uh, we wanna design the framework in such a way that it'll have some sort of interpretable intermediate results that a clinician could look back at to understand the reason for uh, the output given by the network. So admittedly, uh, this framework is a pretty ambitious goal. So we've decided to break it down into three distinct objectives that we believe are obtainable. The first objective is to develop a comprehensive PDA detection model trained on large real world data, uh, which is derived from a relevant target population. Uh, so this would include um, training and testing the model on clinically challenging edge cases. So different types of PDA shunt, uh, such as the left, the traditional left to right PDA shunt, but also bidirectional and left to right shunting cases. Uh, which have different treatment plans and um, different presentations. Our second objective is to develop a joint shunt detection and localization model, which would be trained to jointly both detect PDA, but also highlight regions of interest in the image where uh, PDA shunt is present. And this objective is really important uh, for the system transparency that I was talking about. 
as uh, the regions of interest can be analyzed retroactively. And we also hypothesize that the pixels in these regions of interest are probably the most valuable towards a final um, quantification of severity. Finally, our third objective is that we'd like to develop and validate a pragmatic PDA shunt volume scale. So for example, a unitless scale ranging from one being the smallest shunt volume to five being the largest shunt volume. And then we would like to extend our kind of detection and localization model to predict the severity on this scale that's been given. So these are kind of the main three objectives uh, that we have for this major project. Um, and now I'm going to share some of my pilot work that I've been doing over the last couple of years uh, towards these objectives. Um, the three pilot projects that I'm going to talk about uh, are first, uh, PDA level, uh, video level PDA detection. Secondly, uh, PDA segmentation and PDA significance prediction on a small data set. And thirdly, interpretable immediate re intermediate results with something called GradCam. So over the past few months, I have spent time developing a machine learning framework to detect the presence of PDA in color Doppler echocardiogram videos of variable length. Uh, this work was completed on a data, on a data set of 164 uh, neonatal echocardiogram scans, which were collected uh, by some of the clinicians from Mount Sinai Hospital in Toronto. And the videos were labeled by clinicians as either containing a visible PDA shunt or having no shunt present. Though most cases of PDA display a left to right shunt pattern, um, there are also rare cases uh, that occur with a alternative directionality. And this is just caused by pressure differences in the heart, which causes the blood to flow across the ductus with either a right to left or a bi-directional pattern. And we decided in this work that those cases should still be identified as PDA, um, despite the alternative presentation. Therefore, I included uh, both cases exhibiting uh, bidirectional and right to left shunt inside of the uh, PDA shunt class. So a video vision transformer network was implemented for this work. And on a high level, a uh, video vision transformer is just an end-to-end -end video classification framework, which has shown to have really high success um, on medical data sets and especially uh, medical data sets that are relatively small. Um, essentially, they're composed of something called a transformer. And transformers are, are essentially just a new type of neural network that uh, have excelled a lot in processing and analyzing time series data. So they have a really good, um, uh, they perform really well on video um, classification problems. Um, video vision transformers have the ability to model long range interactions across an entire video, which makes them really suitable for videos of varying length, uh, which means that this framework uh, is able to uh, accept videos with any number of cardiac cycles, meaning a clinician wouldn't have to uh, simply crop a single cardiac cycle. Um, they could uh, add a cardiac, they could um, use this framework on videos with any number of cardiac cycles uh, that start at any point in the cardiac cycle. Essentially, this architecture is just unique um, as it treats an input video as more of a 3D volume, um, and it decomposes that volume into little tiny things called tubes, um, and then it uses those to train the network. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, video vision transformers perform very well on uh, small data sets. And they do this by employing something called pre-training. And pre-training is essentially just uh, the act of training a model on a large, larger, more publicly available data set, um, something that's normally unrelated to the target task, and then later fine tuning it on the task specific data set. So uh, since I did not have a lot of access to a lot of uh, echocardiogram data, I decided to pre-train the network on um, just a publicly available data set called Organ MNIST, which had uh, over 1,700 samples in it and was adequate for uh, giving a baseline before training on the final set. Uh, so with using this architecture, um, 
our video vision transformer achieved a classification accuracy of 92% on a test set of 34 videos. Um, the model was first trained from scratch, uh, but then other methods like uh, pre-training, data augmentation, and data processing were uh, added one at a time, and we saw how they uh, affected performance. Um, from the table, you can see uh, the best result was achieved with pre-training, pre-processing, and data augmentations. Um, and you can also see I've included a confusion matrix here. We can see that two videos in the PDA uh, present class were misclassified as belonging to the no PDA class. Um, and then upon inspection of these videos, we actually saw that they were both uh, right to left shunting PDAs, um, which uh, highlights an area of uh, issue with the, it highlights an area uh, of further work that needs to be done. Um, since this behavior isn't exactly negative, since right to left PDAs uh, shouldn't be treated the same as left to right PDAs, um, but they should still be uh, qualified as a PDA diagnosis. Um, so this really just highlights uh, some of the issues that there are with um, binary prediction, since it is a bit more of a spectrum than a binary yes or no PDA is present. Um, so in the future, we might not want to actually lump all of these PDA classes together. Um, and we might want to have some sort of quantifier that identifies a right to left shunt versus a left to right shunt because that information is necessary for um, clinicians in treatment planning. Um, I also want to just note, uh, note that this architecture was fully opaque. Um, so visu video vision transformers, though they did give a, a good accuracy at classifying, um, don't provide any interpretable intermediate results. It is kind of more of a black box. So this is a good start. Uh, however, definitely more work needs to be done to make this uh, clinically applicable. So the next piece of pilot work that I'm going to talk about is PDA segmentation. Um, and in my PDA segmentation work, uh, I developed a machine learning framework uh, to identify the regions in uh, PDA color job. Uh, sorry, I developed a framework to identify the regions in uh, echo Doppler frames that contained PDA shunt. Um, so to do this, uh, we did manual contouring to outline the boundaries of PDA um, in frames in each uh, Echo Doppler clip that we had. And then the contoured uh, data was used to train a segmentation network uh, to extract uh, this region. So the segmentation process essentially just assigns a label to each pixel in the image, indicating whether or not it belongs to uh, it belongs to the PDA. Um, in this case, everything inside of this green region was labeled as belonging to the PDA. Um, and this work was completed on a data set of videos from 43 neonates with PDA. Uh, the videos again were obtained from Mount Sinai and the clinicians who are here uh, helps me to identify whether a shunt was present and where uh, in the video the region um, of the shunt was. So the framework that was used in this, uh, this part of the project uh, was a UNET-based framework. And UNET frameworks are essentially just uh, these very popular models uh, that have been shown to show really good performance on a lot of medical image segmentation tasks. Uh, these tasks include tumor delineation, also organ segmentation. Uh, they've been very successful in the last few years. Um, and just another bit more depth about UNET, but UNET is a uh, based on convolutional neural networks, uh, which are also called CNNs. And CNNs are uh, essentially just very popular uh, ML models uh, that are designed to analyze visual data um, in a way that mimics human image recognition. So they're just machine learning models that are very good at image recognition. Um, so the UNAP model uh, is named for being U-shaped. <laughs> it's composed of a contracting pathway and an expanding pathway. And it essentially just works to uh, facilitate this pixel level segmentation by doing it on different uh, resolutions of the image. 
Unit architectures are generally trained to minimize something that is called the dice score, um, which is just the difference between the uh, predicted region of interest and the true mask that has been provided. Um, dice score is just a metric that measures the overlap between these uh, the true the, the true segmentation and the predicted segmentation, um, and a higher score indicates better agreement between these two things. Uh, so here are some of the results of my PDA segmentation um, uh, framework. Um, these are all videos that the network was not given access to um, in training. So these were all unseen. And the true mask is shown in blue and the contour of the predicted mask is overlaid in green. So you can just see visually, um, there was pretty high overlap between the true and predicted. Um, and we actually had fairly high success here. Um, here are also some other videos. And one of the limitations I'm just gonna address is that when we fed uh, videos through the network that did not have PDA present, um, our network would occasionally highlight small sorts of bubbles um, because it wasn't quite sure what to do with the no PDA cases. So that highlights an area where we might, might wanna refine further. Um, and then uh, to extend on this segmentation network, um, I developed another uh, framework that could be appended on um, to perform a very simple PDA significance uh, prediction. Um, so a machine learning framework framework in this case uh, was developed to classify the PDA video as either no shunt, um, non-significant shunt, moderately significant shunt, and hemodynamically significant shunt. Uh, all of these labels were assigned um, from the clinicians at Mount Sinai, um, and we made a really small data set again um, of color Doppler videos from 60 uh, patients. Once again, these videos were all of varying length, uh, but we made sure they contained a minimum of two full cardiac cycles. Um, and we used these videos to train our prediction network. So here's just an example frame from each of those four uh, significance classes that we assigned. And then all that uh, we did for the significance classification was uh, I just created a single layer neural network um, to estimate the PDA severity based on the masks of the segmentation network. So going back, what I did was I first fed the PDA video through the segmentation network, obtained the mask of the PDA area, and then used features that were present in that mask uh, to train the prediction network. Um, so the features that we took from these masks uh, were developed based on um, uh, pixel features in uh, Echo Doppler um, data. Um, and first we used some vascular features, which were related to the brightness of the jet. Um, or the brightness of the uh, Doppler pixels in the video. Um, and these uh, features essentially just uh, correspond to the, um, the velocity and the um, direction of the blood flow. Um, additionally, uh, we also added three cardiac cycle features, uh, which were just analyzed by uh, finding the changes of the shunt mask across the entire video. Um, and these included the systolic intensity, the diastolic intensity, and then also the mean intensity across the um, entire, entire video. So features were extracted for all of the videos in the classification data set. And the final classification accuracy for the test set of 20 videos was 75%. I've included a confusion matrix here just to show um, how each video was classified. Um, and it highlights that though the model did misclassify 25% of videos, um, generally most were misclassified into the adjacent significance band. So for example, we had one misclassified hemodynamically significant PDA, 
but it was uh, misclassified as a significant PDA. It wasn't misclassified as a no PDA case. Um, most of the time, uh, misclassifications only happened in the kind of adjacent significances. So the final pilot work uh, that I completed was implementing a um, an approach to better um, to better uh, provide these interpretable mask results um, without having to manually annotate all of the the data. So when I was talking about my segmentation um, model, uh, we had to go through each frame individually and uh, manually contour the PDA area in each frame. This was by far the most time consuming process of the work. Um, it takes a long time to manually um, annotate training videos this way. Um, and because of that, uh, there's a lot of work in uh, things called weekly supervised approaches, which aim to uh, do this type of localization, but without having to manually annotate all of the training data. So what I did in this part is I uh, implemented something called a GradCam architecture. And GradCam is essentially just a technique that's used to visualize uh, regions of an input image that have the highest influence on the network decision. So essentially it just provides a heat map showing what regions of the area were very significant to the classification. For example, we have the left to right shunting video here. Um, and to classify this as a left to right shunt, the network focused most strongly on the areas that actually do correspond to the, uh, the ductus. Um, so this type of, uh, this type of uh, architecture can be appended on to pretty much any type of machine learning framework. And it produces these localization maps without having to do any training on manually annotated data. So all of these kind of localizations here were done without any knowledge of contours. Um, so, yeah. So since I did have some knowledge of contours um, and I didn't want to lose that data, um, what I did was I just got, um, I um, used these uh, manually contoured regions to shift the heat map into the right area um, when that data was available. So yeah, even though we had GradCam was providing these kind of coarse representations of the PDA region, um, it's not trained like a semantic segmentation model and um, the regions of interest are roughly correct, but, um, oops, sorry, <laughs> the regions of interest are roughly correct, but we can shift them by using um, the uh, semantic data that we already have. So now I'm just going to summarize uh, the pilot work that I went over. Um, first off, we had video level uh, PDA detection with the transformer based architecture. Um, in this work, we had accurate detection of PDA in echo Doppler videos with variable length. However, it did highlight some of the challenges with classifying right to left shunting edge cases um, and also that model. Uh, lacked kind of the transparency that we uh, want to integrate in our final model. Um, secondly, we went over the PDA segmentation and significance prediction, um, which showed a good proof of concept for PDA localization and feature extraction. However, the uh, requirement of manually segmenting trading data uh, is not feasible for these like large medical data sets. Um, and then finally, uh, we just went over GradCam, which shows how you can add some coarse localization of PDA um, without the need for all of the manually segmented training data. 
Um, so in conclusion, uh, artificial intelligence has the potential to make significant changes to the diagnosis and assessment of PDA in neonates. We aim to continue working towards developing a machine learning model for reliable auto detection and also shunt quantification of PDAs. And we believe that this framework could, uh, could provide direct and immediate insights into PDA shunt, therefore enabling further understanding of the physiology of PDA. Um, this framework has the potential to allow for earlier uh, diagnosis and potentially treatment decisions uh, that could help avoid PDA-related comorbidities. Um, and pilot work has established proof of concept uh, towards the achievement of this goal. However, there's still a lot of substantial, there's still a lot of work left to be done, uh, which includes further research into video features that correlate with PDA significance, also, we aim to continue developing our data set um, for training, testing, and validation, which would include data acquisition of clinically challenging cases, exhibiting left to right or bidirectional shunts. Um, additionally, we want to gather data across multiple organizations, across as many operators as possible so that we can increase the variability uh, of the data that's seen. Um, we also want to generate this pragmatic PDA shunt volume scale and finally, we aim to validate uh, this scale by uh, to validate this whole model actually by performing correlation between our final ML model and those indirect echocardiographic markers that we currently use for uh, hemodynamically significant PDA diagnosis. Um, I also just wanted to mention that with the help of Dr. Jane and Dr. Zhu at Mount Sinai, we submitted a proposal for. Um, AMO Innovation Fund, and more recently, our abstract was accepted for oral presentation at the Pediatric Academic Society's meeting in May. Um, so that is my whole presentation. Thank you all for listening. Right, people can uh, switch on their videos now. Um, and before we take to the panel and, and have a discussion, first of all, thank you very much, Megan. Uh, for that excellent presentation and and sort of nicely summarizing some complicated topics to some of us who have absolutely no idea how computer scientists think or work, um, and I think sort of um, so making sense for us was was excellent. Um, I would say to everybody that uh, you know, Megan started this work three years ago when I and uh, Naimul happened to come across from some other thing and start talking about trying to develop this model and. And Megan has taken to it um, like fish to water. And I think she is now part neonatologist already uh, and not just a computer scientist who lives and breathes PDA like us, some of us <laughs> right now. So so well done, Megan, for for, for uh, defending your master's on this and then continuing to do a PhD on this and, and, and I'm will for your, for your leadership on that. Um, okay. okay. Um, I've got one question in the chat box, which will be addressed in a second. But before I do, I want to open to the, to the panelists here. Uh, perhaps um, I will start with uh, Daniel and, and Wyman because Naimul has a uh, you know box office seat to all the work that Megan is doing. So um, owing to his bias, I will let him come last. <laughs> okay, now, Daniel and Wyman, any 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 thoughts, any questions for Megan and, and, and Naimul, or or any any comments before we take the questions? Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's a great study, and uh, as Dr. Jane knows we, you know, we're working on some of this stuff as well and to try to have some predictors uh, for PDA, but um, <clears throat> I guess one of my, I, I, I think this is great. So I know you had talked about a lot of the, the difficulties. So your right to left PDAs, your bidirectional PDAs, those kinds of things. Um, and I just uh, wanted to point out one um in particular, which is the left to right PDA that is predominantly left to right, but does have a small tidge of, of right to left because it's just, these are like the most hemodynamically significant PDAs, right? Um, and, you know, do you think in the future, I know you have a lot of work to do, but do you think in the future, your predictor will actually be able to, um, discern bidirectional PDAs and hemodynamically significant bidirectional PDAs. I feel like it's its own little class, you know? Yeah, I I, I understand what you're saying. Um, 
I think that that is the reason why we should have maybe more of a focus on the quantifying portion of it. Um, because there are so many predictive classes that things could fit into and subclasses within those. And I think sometimes if it's just focused on predicting this is hemodynamic, this is hemodynamically significant, or this is bidirectional, and we're treating them as like a binary case, that there will be cases that are stuck in the middle. Um, and I think if we focus more on kind of the generation of a spectrum um, where uh, cases could fit in between any different um, category, that that has maybe more uh, applicability in that it wouldn't, uh, someone might not get lumped into the wrong category if we focus on putting things more on a spectrum. Um, but I think for those cases specifically where there's um, a little bit of bidirectional or like a little bit of right to left or left to right, um, I think that we would wanna focus on um, one, having things uh, classified on that, uh, on a scale as to the amount of shunt and um, the directionality of it as well. Um, and focus on that across the um, entire videos instead of just like individual frames. And I think that's kind of our problem, right? Is that that spectrum? Because you, you know, like we've had a lot more success with the zeros and the, the oh, this is really huge. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot less success in that spectrum. And so I think that's just something all of us need to continue working on and figuring out how to discern. Yeah, I mean, just to clarify, the one that Megan presented, uh, because those were annotated by us, um, we had pre-hand decided that we were only going to annotate a PDA as bidirectional if it was more than 20% right to left of a cardiac cycle. Okay. So that any trickle of, uh, you know, 5% right to left would still was annotated as left to right for that purpose of this initial, but, but you're, you're right. Um, it's one of the things we have come across, and that's going to be her uh, abstract PAS, that once we start doing the bidirectional PDA, how the model didn't behave um, the same with the same accuracy as it does for a left to right shunting PDA, um, and and uh, you know those are very very valid points, and there are challenges in in, in the in the use of AI in this particular domain. Uh, but when we started off this, and again when Anamal and and Megan sort of and we got together, they basically asked us what is the real clinical problem that they want us because that's what we want to solve, and that's what we wish we shared with them that detection of or just the presence is not really a real clinical problem. Like, I mean, it's not that hard deal for easy training people to look at the color opera and say, yes, there's a left, right PDA, it's presence. But that's a starting point. But the real clinical problem is, is, is auto shunt quantification of some degree where we don't have to rely on the surrogate markers becoming significant and then the plethora of markers. And that, that would simplify a lot if it can auto detect and auto pick a change in the net left to right shunt volume. Um, I think that's where the, the the vision is for our PhD and I don't know whether we'll succeed or not, but clearly she's done a lot of work towards that goal. And hopefully that will address some of things what you were saying, Daniel, that you know, it doesn't matter whether it's bidirectional. We're talking about net left to right shunt overall yeah. cardiac cycle. I think also the other um, the other issue that we have and one of the problems with kind of our PDA trials in general is that, you know, if you pick a size, so, um, you know, 1.5 millimeter PDA. Well, you know, a 1.4 millimeter PDA would not be treated or would not be, you know, randomized in these trials. However, a 1.4 millimeter PDA in a 500 gram baby is a huge shunt. And so I guess I'm assuming you guys kind of looked at size to weight as well when discerning whether you said it was hemodynamically significant or not. But I wonder if when this goes out into the open, will it be able to 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 tell if you know that is a, a small baby with a big shunt or a small shunt in a big baby yeah. at, at the same size. True. Um, and that that's the vision that we will get away from the diameter uh, story of things yeah. altogether. Um, but um, you know, I'm I'm sure women will know that and will probably add more from a pediatric cardiology world perspective, right? There are there are children who can tolerate a disease more 
and the other children who can tolerate not tolerate the same disease. So that that sort of uh, even though the scale is two for one, it might be big deal, and for one, it might not be. And so that 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 I, I think that always going to be a challenge to prehand decide just based on clinical alone or echo alone what is significant because significance depends upon how you're calling it, right? Well, I mean, any thoughts? Uh, first, Megan, and Anna, I mean, this is great. Uh, congratulations on doing this project. I think your your goals are spot on. I, I think you're taking the right uh, approach. Uh, personally, what we did and, and what I'd recommend is just throw out the right to left PDAs at this point. They're just too hard for even humans to figure out what to do with them. And they might be your friends. So I'm, I think that would be my easy solution for that. But the hard part is how do you determine what is truly hemodynamically significant and whether or not you have that in your data set? Because until, unless you do, it will be very hard to say an echocardiographically significant yeah. ductus <clears throat> is uh, worth treating versus a, a patient who, as Amish just said, has a significant shunt and actually is suffering from it. So as we know from our VSD patients that the same size defect will not need to be treated until 10 years in one patient and maybe in two months or three months or another patient. Same thing goes with the size of shunt. A two to one shunt in some patients is much more damaging than a two to one shunt in a, an older or just another patient. So really it is very, as you said, patient specific. So that's what we were trying to get to and what you're trying to get to. Uh, one other comment is that I know the MUSC group, uh, rather than just location, where it was able to train their model on timing of the cardiac cycle, or just the, the model itself figured out that diastole was an important part of each uh, sequence of each uh, uh, video clip, and the model itself trained to weight the diastolic images more significantly, and I thought that was a way to go in terms of we can do that with our model at chalk but i wish we could have and i don't know if you have any thoughts on on whether or not your model uh, might benefit from that and then the other question is do you plan to add in other clips because i think uh, in terms of hemodynamic significance certainly you will have more information on your echocardiogram than just the ductal clip you want to answer that megan you want to sort of address some of that yeah, um, so I did, I know the paper that you're um, referring to about the uh, diastolic uh, frames versus the systolic frames. Um, I also, uh, I believe we did actually look through it and in the diastolic uh, clips, there are, I mean, just visually based on my uh, looking at it, um, there's a bit less turbulence I've noticed in the, uh, the PDAs. So I think that that could be some of the reasoning as to why it's easier to classify those videos. Um, but I think also integrating architectures that focus on um, the entire time series data, as opposed to just the individual frames is going to be really important going forward. Um, and I think that that paper also used kind of a similar transformer type uh, architecture to what I used. Um, so I think going forward, starting to use these sequential models in addition with the visual ones is going to be really important, uh, especially when we have cardiac cycles and we, we know that the cardiac cycle is going to keep repeating. Um, so I think that that's going to be important. Um, and then, sorry, what was your, the second part of your question? Uh, well, when we were looking at this, we clipped it, didn't use just a four chamber view. Just oh, of yes. Yeah. Of ventricular size and volume and left atrial size and volume. Uh, but you'll have many more clips in your study. I'm just wondering if you plan to expand that or you're going to stay with a doctor clip. So, so far, we don't have any plans to uh, use different clips. Um, however, I will say for uh, many other medical AI frameworks. Um, so I think there's a few for... Um, ejection fraction calculation. There's some other cardiac um, works out there that do try to incorporate multi-viewpoint clips. Um, and they have shown that the more viewpoints you have, the higher accuracy um, you do get with training. However, uh, the model size, um, the training and the complexity 
also increases as you add those in. So for now, I think we're gonna focus on the small single ductal view. Um, but yeah, going forward, that would be a really cool investigation to do. Yeah, and then I think to add to that, I mean, it's a very in, 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 crucial part. And, and uh, we had to make the choice, uh, sort of a little bit of that decision in the beginning, when we are trying to automate uh, PDA detection and PDA shunt volume, create a new so a new scale, so to speak, uh, the left ventricular uh, volume is a surrogate marker that we use clinically. So if you know LD is dilated, then it makes us say, okay, this must be a significant shunt volume and so on and so forth. So rather than replicating what we're already doing, we thought for simplistic sake, for pragmatic sake, if we can create something that is detecting a shunt volume, net blood being passed through a particular channel on its own, then we can use the echocardiographic markers like the LV volume and LV dilatation so to validate that shunt scale. Um, does it correlate with a change in LV volume in a patient over time or in a different patient that way rather than training it already by telling it what the LV size is and, and you're right, I mean, if we if our shunt scale doesn't perform as well as we want, then that would be a way to go to actually complement that information by other surrogate information from the LV. But if we could, if she could track it nicely, which correlates well, then it would be the most simplest solution possible. And um, uh, that's how we're starting off with. Uh, <clears throat> um, um, right. Willem has asked a very interesting question um, in the chat, and, and I will be relying on the panelists here uh, to answer that. And it's been sort of been in my mind also. Um, he says, uh, first of all, he congratulates you, Megan, for your excellent work, and, and, and I agree. Um, Willem is asking, um, how will it be possible to assess strong uh, transductal shunt volume using machine learning only by 2D imaging? Um, I guess he's trying to say is that the, because the configuration of PDA can be different in a three-dimensional structure, would a 3D imaging quantification be more accurate as from a to from a reality perspective than a 2d mapping of the structure um, anybody want to talk about 3d versus 2d or 4d i guess <laughs> um so i'm not uh, an expert on three-dimensional uh, echo imaging i don't know a lot about it um but I understand what you're saying about the uh, variability in the configuration. Um, I think that the best way to address that uh, for 2D um, is to obtain as much data as possible. Um, if we can, since in the, from what I understand, at least of the, uh, the shunt viewpoint, um, we are seeing the shunt through the vessel regardless of its configuration. Um, so as long as we can get, I think, a, a reflective data set of as many um, configurations as possible, hopefully our model would be able to learn to distinguish shunt regardless of that. Um, but I, I can imagine that having three-dimensional data would, would certainly be helpful, but again, would add far more complexity to the model, um, which is maybe not something that we want to focus on right now. I mean, any, any thoughts about 3D echoes from a pediatric cardiology perspective? We know that it, in terms of uh, evaluating mitral regurgitation shunt, uh, that a 3D vena contracta is better than a two-dimensional vena contracta. So the challenge is getting that image, and I don't think it's going to be possible. We're far away from having three-dimensional probes that, that will allow for preterm infant imaging. But it's always the goal. But even having said that, the challenges of the ductus is that there are sometimes focal constrictions that are the limiting uh, degree of narrowing, or is that the limiting, the major limiting factor of flow? And sometimes it's diffuse uh, narrowing. And so those shunts are behave differently, we know. Um, and I, I think that's a challenge. Sometimes it's hard to capture on your one two dimensional image the exact area of the maximal narrowing and extrapolating that two dimensional image then into three dimensional information is what. I think William is uh, saying can be challenging. Yeah, yeah and I think uh, I mean, I said, I mean, the three-dimensional imaging 
uh, of adopt us. It's maybe possible in slightly bigger kids who are, you know, with, but it's really challenging to get the data set. And then that makes it very, at this time point, at least not translatable to majority of the population who suffers from the lactose atriosis and, 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 the, and the centers. But once three-dimensional echo imaging becomes standard of care in 500 gram babies, then everything we've done so far will become obsolete. <laughs> we'll start again. <laughs> okay. Anything, any other questions, any other suggestions? Sorry, Naimul, Naimul, you have not, sorry, I've not given you any chance to speak at all. Oh, no, no, it's uh, it's perfectly fine. Uh, this is uh, this is like throwing your PhD student under fire, right? So that's <laughs> But I, I did want to, like, from the discussions and especially questions from uh, Daniel, thank you for the insight that, you know, left to right uh, shunts also have some miniature right to left shunt as well. So, Megan, I, I was wondering, you know, like you have like you are attacking the problem for many diff for many different angles, right? Like classification, segmentation, because of the nature of the problem, it's very hard to like pin down one, right? So I was wondering, in an ideal world, let's say if we were able to segment the PDA perfectly across all frames, no errors at all, right? Of course, it's a long way to get there. In that case, uh, like, do we actually need a video label for left to right shunt or right to left shunt anymore? Because ideally from the PDA, segmented PDA and the blood flow, we should be able to frame by frame, we should be able to exactly identify whether it's left to right or right to left. And across the video, we can probably do some sort of analysis. Is that correct? Yes, for the most part, uh, the only issue would be uh, Doppler aliasing, uh, which may trick the network at some point in some time, but uh, there's also a lot of research into how to combat uh, Doppler aliasing. Um, but yeah, if we uh, could perfectly segment the PDA every time, I don't think that those uh, exact uh, labels as bi-directional or right to left would be needed. And we should be able to uh, ideally graph out maybe with the cardiac cycle, the directionality of the, the blood flow as well. Right. Perfect. So in that, in that case, my follow-up question would be, so the segmentation is the critical aspect here, right? And which of course is very difficult to do because of the nature of the videos. So like the last bit of work that you have shown, I know that you are currently in the process of improving it with the grad cam approach, right? So like how, like, Wow. What what could be the, I know it's a very difficult question to answer, but what would be the ratio of like how many like annotated, pixel-wise annotated videos would we need so that it can reach to like a you know, acceptable level of segmentation performance there, right? So. Um, That's a great question. Uh, I would go with, I mean, the current state-of-the-art medical data sets have around, I think, 2,000 to 3,000 annotated videos, which is a huge amount of data. Um, so I'm not sure if that obtaining that amount is going to be feasible for this study, but for uh, even the organ MNIST that I mentioned earlier, uh, those publicly available data sets all include uh, and it, like fully annotated data from 2,000 to 3,000 patients usually. Okay, no, this is a good pitch uh, in front of this committee, right? Because we have a multi-central <laughs> presentation here, right? So if the MO grant is uh, successful, right? That's something that we can attempt, right? Like as much data as possible, like annotated uh, video, like pixel level data. Uh, thank you, Megan, for the great presentation. I don't have any other question. Yep. Perhaps we can have a question for the other panelists about um, sort of bringing it more to the clinical side of things. Um, you know, say, you know, with Megan's project is successful and we have a shunt volume estimation scale, um, any thoughts on how best to validate the scale? I'll just throw out that I think you, you do want the clinical uh, outcomes data, and that will be sort of the golden piece of information what some other institu uh, institutions or organizations have done have, has been to produce a model data set that then institutions can test their algorithms, can test their models towards, and then having that clinical outcome is sort of the gold standard then of, of outcome. I, it's always a little tricky to use surrogate outcomes. And so that's what I would just say that, that it is something that we can, as a community, work towards. It would be, you know, very helpful because then all the different algorithms uh, can be tested against this data set. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that would be. Oh, 
Go ahead. Well, go on, go on. I was just saying. Hey, that would be my question is, um, have you looked at the implementation science portion, portion of this? In that um, oftentimes a lot of these algorithms that come out uh, don't actually get used by any institutions because the implementation science wasn't there and they weren't able to actually put it to use. So um, have you looked into how you could disseminate this? Have you, Megan? <laughs> She's been very personally. Focused. No, I've been focused on developing. I I think these are still just proof of concepts. Um, I think we definitely want a lot more data before we even want to begin disseminating any of this. And I mean, I would would say that we it's it's a, it's on the back of our mind. I mean, as, as Megan said, this is right now at the stage of multiple different proof of concepts put together. Uh, where now these will have to be trained and perform better. First, we have to be convinced that they're actually doing what it's supposed to do. Uh, but it has been in the back of our mind from the very beginning to try and keep it simple, to try and keep it such that it is equi uh, easily translatable. Um, the echo will always be done by sonographer, so to speak, whether it's a physician doing it or whether it's a actual sonographer doing it. But that image should be directly read by the software on the computer itself. I mean, eventually the, the dream would be that, a, you know, companies buy it and implement that in their machines. Uh, but that's that's not gonna, that's not gonna be the easiest thing to do. But we certainly can create a software where people can just load on the computer. As the as the DICOM image comes in or an AVI image comes in, the software just reads on its own and gives you a automated number saying this is a shunt volume scale four or three or two. So I think, that would be the vision that we've been starting, that we sort of started off this with, that that's where we want to be. That should be that easy, that it's easily applicable in any uh, um, domain, any place with computers and, and, and machines. Um, the question, a bigger question is what it's telling us, the scale is three, two, one, four, five. Is it really scales one, two, three, four, five? And then does it really mean, uh, I think that validation piece is going to be very crucial to sell it to the people, to the end user. And I think I agree with what I meant. Uh, that um, at the end of the day is really the clinical validation piece that you want to do. We can demonstrate some sort of correlation or association between different sh scales that we are generating and the patient's clinical outcomes. That probably will be the, the because we can't really get a gold standard validation of actual shunt volume. Um, but but that, that sort of a future aspect of once the creation part of that. But it's a, it's a good point. And perhaps at some point in the middle of the, this whole process, we should start looking at implementation sciences a little bit more thoroughly to try to understand uh, because right now our understanding from a team point of view of implementation sciences is relatively weak. We understand the global concept, but not necessarily the details of it. But yeah, that's a good point. I just wanted to add a little more to the implementations from this implementation science aspect. So like uh, when we started this project with uh, Mount Sinai, we had two pieces. One is the lung piece, one is the PDA piece. So with the lung, since it's a little more like uh, definitive, right? So we are actually doing some of that now. So what we did was we developed the, like exactly what uh, Amish mentioned. We developed the software, we're installing it at a computer there. So we're gonna do some usability study of the software itself, like whether the software itself is actually usable, right? So just the usability of the software. And then eventually like the clinical validation aspect will come in. And then once the clinical validation shows that, okay, there's some clinical uh, usefulness of this software, then what we can do is then I think we can go into a longitudinal study in terms of putting this software in the workflow, right? And see that whether this putting this in the workflow it actually achieves something, right? Like basically doing a randomized control trial. So that would be the very last aspect, but that will obviously take years. But I think the immediate step would be even like once the algorithm performs reasonably well, like creating a software just to load some AVI or DICOM at a computer at the hospital to see that we just put that into the workflow does that actually do anything right so yeah so on the lung piece we are actually doing that now okay yes Simon. um yeah. as a novice here for computer science how, you know, you've mentioned that this was a three-year project but computer science has gone from you know rnn uh, AN, cnns to rnns now you have some sort of 3d video model which i don't understand how, how often do you have to update your your uh, models to the new technologies that you have, and is is that something continuously done? I, I see you smiling. I don't know. Yeah, this is a very naive question. 
Um, so I guess, yeah, oftentimes I am trying things out on the new state of the art. Uh, luckily, because it's computer engineering, uh, that information is disseminated instantly, um, which is pretty cool. Um, so for example, with the video vision transformers, that's a very recent um, kind of advancement and I was able to put it into practice two months ago. Um, so the fact that it is software does allow us to uh, kind of just uh, plug and play with some of the elements. Um, so yeah, I definitely have my eyes out for new things that I think might be applicable, but it is, it's also a huge amount of, uh, of work being done all the time. So. And if I could ask a follow-up, are, are you, you're using GPUs, you're using IN things that I can't get my hands on, I'm guessing. Um, so as of right now, um, actually a lot of my work so far, uh, not related to this specific project, um, but I did a bit of work in uh, left ventricular ejection fraction estimation. Um, and all of that work was actually uh, focused on um, lower complexity algorithms. Um, so I am kind of coming from a place of trying to use more limited resources, um, probably ones that someone would have, uh, like a GPU someone would have access to on a laptop, for example, uh, not some crazy uh, sending it to the cloud and running it on multiple GPUs. Um, so as of right now, all the models that I've talked about have been um, relatively uh, simplistic and measured in terms of their uh, parameters. I just wanted to add a couple of um, more comments on the scalability issue of here, right? Like, you know, like, the scalability, I think, for medical, especially the highly specific projects like this, will come from the data, right? Like the GPU is not, I don't think, gonna be a big issue here, right? Uh, because uh, like basically, consumer GPUs can handle the models that Megan is developing, and Megan is very good at like you know making it more efficient. Like she she has a good engineering paper on that as well for the left ventricular part, like when the model was smaller, more efficient, right? But I think the scalability issue comes from data. As you can see, right, like that, all these uh, consumer applications like chat, GPT, and whatnot, they are trained on like billions and trillions of data points that people are just sitting there and picking and labeling, right? So of, of course, for clinical applications and highly specialized clinical applications like this, we cannot have crowdsourced data, right? It has to be data from clinicians. So I think the more data we can feed the algorithms, the better it becomes, but that data scalability is something that we cannot really solve with like even GPUs, right? So data is the big problem here. Um, in the end, I mean, we are out of time, but I'll just quickly ask one last thing that's been put on there. Uh, if anybody has any thought about, um, another question has come is, oh, is any thoughts on the use of ultra fast plane wave imaging, including vector flow imaging? Uh, to, to, to quantify transductal shunt volume. Now ultra fast, uh, plane wave imaging is taking, uh, uh, it's coming out in papers a little bit. It's, uh, we have started doing, uh, uh, from with, uh, with Luke Mertens in cardiology lab, they have one machine, it's a massive machine. We've just finished recruiting 50 babies uh, for one of the master's project which, with, with Luke and uh, primarily Luke, um, and I'm, I'm co-supervising, who's done ultra-fast echo imaging for 50 term, uh, healthy term infants to create normative data. Um, my experience is, that takes a lot of time. Uh, first of all, the machines are not available everywhere. This is a specific research machine that they have only one machine that we have been using. It's not yet scalable, but also the post-processing at this time point takes a lot of time. And the person I was talking to, poor master student, each echo had to sit for an analysis of just one part of the echo it takes about two and two and a half hours to generate that data, um, at least at this time point. That's my understanding is, in, does anybody else any any other thoughts about ultra-fast imaging? Maybe we should invite Willem to speak here. He can speak. <laughs> Willem, maybe we'll catch up with you in PAS and you can tell us all about your doing the ultra-fast imaging because most of us don't really have a lot of experience in using that technology. Um, <clears throat> okay. So I think I think with this we will we'll, uh, call the session a close. This was a very interactive discussion. Thank you very very much for all the panelists, um, and once again, uh, well done, Megan, uh, and 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 well done, Naimul, for supervising her uh, and making sure that she converts her masters into a PhD and not disappear. <laughs> okay, excellent. All right, thank you, everyone. Nice seeing you. Bye, everyone.
บายได้นะ